So hi, hi everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you to Stephen and the team for giving us the, the privilege of uh, having a, a bit of a session here today, tonight, and uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, we'll go through uh, some slides first just to set the scene and uh, hopefully do some demo. Uh, typically, Andrew and I kind of tag team these demos, um, but we decided due to his children and technology challenges, I might just do the demo today, but Andrew built the whole environment. So if you've got any deep questions, you'll be able to hopefully answer them. Uh, so the topic is leveraging SRE practices in uh, brownfields environments. Um, lots of words on the screen, but let me set the scene. Uh, obviously, SRE has been around a long time. It's been probably used by the hyperscalers to deliver their services at, at scale, of, at a global scale. And really, um, the argument here today is can we adopt some of these SRE principles in more of the types of environments that we traditionally work in, uh, those enterprise environments that have mixed sorts of versions of operating systems and applications, some new, some old. How do we adopt those practices? Um, I've been working in the industry for a long time. Um, over the last couple of years, I'm seeing uh, more SRE type roles in these enterprises, like uh, SRE teams forming or, or initial uh, SRE type resources being hired in. So it's a thing uh, and people are trying to do it not just for cloud native type environments, but also uh, maybe in some of these traditional operations types environments as well. So that's the topic today. Um, but before I get into it, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the, we have a Red Hat SRE team um, uh, within Red Hat. They've been working and doing, uh, providing a service around our OpenShift, which is our enterprise Kubernetes platform, uh, the PaaS environment, as well as we manage um, OpenShift clusters for our customers running in, say, some of the main public clouds, such as AWS and Google and, and Azure. Uh, they've been established for over, you know, six, seven years now. Uh, this data is one year old, um, but uh, Narayan, who runs that team, uh, does a fabulous presentation. Maybe we can pull him across one day to, to talk to you all about how he does this for, for this environment. But yeah, so this environment that they manage uh, was established in 2013, has been growing and growing strongly. It runs um, across the world uh, around about 4 million apps. So some really big numbers here. 80 plus uh, clusters uh, running in 12 regions. Over the course of, of its life, uh, it's been uh, adopted by 750,000 developers 6,000 new users are, um, are running or, or, or clicking on these applications that have been built by these developers with like on average 2,000 new application services being delivered, right? So it's an incredibly large platform that's delivered across the globe at scale, uh, running very critical workloads, as you can imagine. And uh, typically I ask a question to the audience, but I won't today because or, or, or someone can answer up if you want. Um, how many people sort of run this this environment, do you think? Anyone want to hazard a guess? I can't see the chat. Pick a number, 150, 100. Oh, I'll I won't leave you in suspense. It's actually nine people. So Narayan runs this team. I keep saying that he doesn't want to grow the team too much um, because the approaches that they take can scale, right? So he's saying maybe I'll hire a couple more people, a couple more security people, but he's not going to be growing a team uh, much larger than say 10 to 12 people uh, over uh, and they're going to grow even faster and manage a lot more. So um, I thought I'd share some of the, his guiding principles, their guiding principles um, and share it today and then get into um, maybe how we adopt these in, in more traditional type environments. Uh, so here's some of the guiding principles. You've probably read and heard about them if you're a bit of an enthusiast around SRE, but one of the first things that they started to do because they had to evolve from maybe sort of a traditional way of working to more of an SRE style of working. And one of the things that they sort of uh, aspired to do was really look uh, for patterns, as they say, of, uh, that happen often enough. And rather than fixing them uh, manually and just looking to automate first, rather than looking to address those challenges manually, uh, they started maybe um, at 70%, but over the time they're getting to that sort of 85% where they're automating rather than fixing manually or break fixing manually. And, you know, that's a, an aspirational goal that they've set themselves and they've got there over that course of that time, right? So still a little bit of manual out there for sure, but looking and striving for automation 
as much as possible. And of course, the culture changes. You know, how are you going to adopt this in a, in a traditional environment? The culture is everything, and without that culture, you're not going to be achieve the outcomes of an SRA team. Uh, obviously, this is something that's happening any anyway. But developers need skin in the game. It's not just operations people holding the the, the pages. Uh, it's the, the people that are contributing to the platform, ch changing the platform, need to have some skin in the game. Uh, the concept of the error budget, as you may be aware of, you know, breaking things is normal. No longer are we saying you can never break anything. In order to introduce change, you will create problems in the environments. But it's really a concept of the error budget, accepting errors and, ch and failure as normal, um, giving contributors to the platform an error budget. So for this three-month period, this quarter, um, you can uh, contribute four major change, major problems into the environment. The moment you exceed that, and even if you exceed that in the first week, um, guess what? You're not going to be able to contribute until you can prove you've improved your errors, uh, your, your ways. And, of course, you know, resisting the manual, right? So they've gone to the to the point where they lock down SSH by a human into, a, into an environment so they can do everything through automation. So they go to that sort of level and resisting and resisting that 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 that, that sort of uh, initial thing under pressure. I've got to go fix it manually, and 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 this is some of the some of the uh, guiding principles that they've adopted. And then he goes on to a little bit about how they deal with the day to day. He starts day zero. It's generally day one, but it's negative one. Um, but day zero is really around you know obviously being able to install what you need uh, from scratch. Uh, from automation, push button sort of uh, builds of environments, really critical because you want to build these environments as frequently as you need to, especially if you have to build new ones for new customers, et cetera, like they do. Um, getting into the day one, uh, configuring and tuning the environment rather than manually through automation. Again, those patterns are important. Looking for those patterns and automating that is a good way to begin. And start to incorporate monitoring and alerting into how you run your day-to-day, -day, obviously, um, to the point where, you know, you've got to add not just for the for the uh, monitoring and learning capabilities for the underlying infrastructure, but also for the applications that are built upon the infrastructure, allowing them to contribute and add on top of the underlying operational side of monitoring as well. And, of course, um, then they get into the problem, the day two scenarios where things start to go wrong, uh, monitoring, looking uh, for common types of uh, problems that are occurring to the system uh, and creating um, automated healing of those events, self-healing. So a monitoring event takes place. It's a common challenge. It happens often enough, creating an automation that self-heals and only call a human or page a human if problem persists and then also providing that visibility into, for the end users around what's going on. So that's another principle is providing visibility to the uh, people who are using the platform and giving them a visibility of what's actually going on and then really taking it all the way uh, upgrading when you've got an application or platform that's running critical applications upgrades can be you know risky um, so they have approaches around upgrading obviously with the mutable you can you can provision a new version and the other version turns off they also have this concept of you know, being able to set up a, a mirror cluster, um, have the application still running uh, on the old cluster, and then migrating the data over time carefully, maybe keeping both systems in sync for a while until that new platform actually, you know, proves that it's going to be okay uh, before and having a rollback strategy and moving forward. And this team really strives to do this really all in an automated fashion, embracing some of these uh, principles but also approaches um, day to day. But the big question, really the question is today is obviously what Ryan says, his job's easy. I don't think it's easy, but he goes, it's easier than um, how do you SRing in a world where everything is uh, you know, different. Lots of, uh, these are my little snowflakes here, guys, but lots of snowflakes out there. So one of the advantages that he has is that at least the environment that they support is fairly homogenous. Uh, it's essentially open shift clusters sitting on maybe various different uh, clouds, um, but the underlying infrastructure being very, very sort of similar but different, you know. They have a homogenous system and they can apply that. So today we're going to look at maybe how we can adopt some of these principles, apply them uh, uh, into these more, you know, 
difficult, challenging, snowflaked environments and, uh, you, know, you know, to produce similar results to maybe what SRE teams do. So with that, I was going to set up uh, the demo that Andrew's created uh, with a bit of a picture and then actually demo it for you. So let me do that. I like my pictures because my words are not so great. <laughs> I find it hard to string together the words. So look, um, one of the things we're going to look at is, you know, here's a, my very basic picture of a mixed heterogeneous environment with a little bit of everything potentially. Um, and then we're going to obviously start with, you know, the operations people working in a traditional way. Uh, they have their laptops and they go in and typically log into a console and run commands, okay? That's what a console looks like. We've seen it before. Um, as the team evolves, uh, as the team gets bigger, typically uh, you need to document these approaches. And what does we know? The moment you write a document, it's out of, out of date the moment, <laughs> the next day. Keeping these documents up to date never happens. They get left on the shelf and people just have the IP in their heads, which can be challenging. And then obviously uh, a good next step is to start to script um, your your day to day task, and you've got many options. You can use Python, Bash, PowerShell for Windows. We're going to pick on Windows today um, and look at some of that, how that works. And then, of these operation teams are feeling pretty good. They can start to have a lot more code, uh, a lot more uh, scripting. But as you know, scripting uh, you, you're running a lot of it. You've got to manage it. It can be challenging as these scripts get bigger and more complicated. And sometimes when an individual who's written the script leaves, it's really hard to manage, not really well commented, the usual sort of scenarios that we get to see out there. So the argument today is potentially to look to maybe leverage an automation language. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ansible today because I work for Red Hat. Nonetheless, you can replace Ansible with something else or even scripts itself. The processes and methodologies I'm going to talk about really work in, in a different way, in the same way. Ansible gives you the ability maybe to reduce the amount of code because we use the modules. But the idea is to really take uh, maybe this Windows box, running an IIS server on 2.16, whatever that may be, whatever version of our operating system, take that. And that all, that all that server is really is a series of instructions and steps in a playbook or in script format and, a, and, a, and data, some configuration. And that's essentially being able to check that in. So then we get the operations teams potentially, oops, sorry, that up again, lost that, sorry. Um, checking in that particular Windows IIS server into code. And, you know, that's a, another thing that operations teams, traditional oper operations teams may not be using today. They're not, not using a lot of source control and thinking like a developer. But being able to codify this application uh, and store it into source control uh, enables you to leverage the benefits of source control, but also um, um, borrow from some of the developer principles and apply that to your infrastructure, um, have hopefully allow you to move, automate more, but also automate more safely because you can easily automate bad problems as well as fix good problems, of course. So the other thing um, we, we kind of think about is once you've, you, you, uh, once you've checked stuff in, what can we do from that point onwards? And what developers do is they do a lot of good unit testing. They use maybe NUnit, JUnit, or the raft of other unit testing technologies. With Ansible, we have something called Molecule. Again, the principles apply to, you know, whether you're using scripting or JUnit or some other um, type of unit testing framework. But Molecule is written for Ansible code. Um, you may be familiar with it. It's, again, part of the Ansible project and free to use whenever you want to. Um, you want to do a lint. So you've written a great script, uh, just like a developer. You want to lint that code and make sure it adheres to uh, industry standard. You make sure it adheres to your internal standards that you want set yourself within your in a team. Um, the other thing I'm going to use today, there's a whole suite of them. I'll go through them all the ability to create a temporary environment. So you've made a change to an uh, IIS server, uh, you've changed the playbook or the, or the script that's going to do something or change the behavior of that server. Before you want to maybe allow that to be checked in and maybe you know taken to the next stage, you might want to do a little test on that. So spinning up an environment. So Molecule allows you to spin up a temporary environment 
A container is a really great thing uh, to, to use for this particular situation because they spin up super fast and come down and, and they're very, very lightweight. But it's essentially spinning up the target system that you want to test against and testing your changes against that. The other nice uh, thing to think about is this concept of item potence. Um, it's, a, it's a thing, but essentially uh, the way I describe it is a concept of desired state. Uh, for example, you want to change uh, a particular setting on a server. Uh, all that this really does is, the first thing it does, is it in the state I need it to be in? If it is, do nothing. Uh, and being able to create scripts or playbooks that are item potent in nature really are very powerful because you can run them over and over again and, and, and know that it will push that particular bit of infrastructure back to its desired state or report if it's drifted from desired state or from what's in source control. Um, so there's some of the key features, uh, some of the things to think about as you make change to do your testing. And to do that testing, you want to incorporate a pipeline. Again, things that developers use, but you can incorporate this to infrastructure type situations. So I'm going to show a pipeline today. Uh, it's going to be GitLab. I'm using GitLab today. It doesn't really matter. Pipelines are pipelines. Uh, a trend towards Tekton, I feel, in the industry, but something for a discussion. Um, so this pipeline that I'm going to use today is going to be testing my change that I've just made. It's going to do a pre-check. It's always good to check before you start anything. Assume that the guy before you or girl before you didn't do the right thing, so always clean up. Run my lint against my change. Make sure I haven't broken my industry or internal best practices in terms of how I write my scripts or Ansible playbooks. I want to deploy, which would basically create a temporary environment. I'm going to spin up a VM in AWS. Uh, I'm going to run my item potence test to make sure I haven't broken item potency because that's a cool thing to be able to strive for in making changes through automation across an environment. And then I'm going to do a bit of cleanup. That's what the pipeline is going to look like. So, that, so assuming it goes all green, um, I've done a lot of work as I've made a change. So I'm going to change my script, my playbook here. It's going to do all this checking. I'm going to feel relatively confident that I've done done anything bad or broken, at least my unit tests. Then the next thing I'm going to do, just like a developer, I'm going to go to the next phase and I'm going to do my promotion from test to another stage. I might want to do my peer review. I want another set of eyeballs. This is where Andrew looks at my playbook and goes, Jim, you got it wrong, sends it back. Um, but once everything is peer reviewed, maybe change control in these, um, in, in these enterprise environments needs to be you know, a lot more change control. You might have to have, raise a ticket. You know, uh, A lot of uh, the customers we work to, we try and incorporate change in standard change control, uh, standard, st uh, st uh, standard changes, so you don't have to go through the change control boards. And we try to prove the case that we've done this many times with automation. It should be a standard change, even though we're doing something that could potentially break stuff. And then finally, you want to do your merge and take that change or that feature that you just made or a bunch of features, merge them into master. And then you want to release. And the idea is release fairly frequently, release small amounts frequently, um, easier to roll back. Um, but the idea is we're going to use our tower here to release it. And you can use your automation platform of choice. And again, the goal, even with these brownfields environment, and I'll probably talk a little bit how to get there, um, you want to try and strive for maybe flipping it. Right now, in organizations I, I work with, particularly with these brownfield environments, it's more like 90% uh, manual and 10% um, auto automated and really helping our customers start to switch that balance. I'm not saying you're going to get to 85%, but just by getting to from 10 to 20 to 30, you, you're starting to buy back time, move a little bit quicker and safer, and maybe even get there even faster in the end. So yeah, I'm going to demo all this working today if I'm lucky. Um, and again, uh, kudos to uh, Andrew who normally takes over and does this bit. I'm going to do it for him uh, because of the technology and uh, the fact that these kids might run in. So let me go and do this. So as I said today, I'm going to pick on IIS. I built an IIS application. It's sitting on a Windows VM inside AWS today. And it uh, looks like this. It's a very simple website, very simple traditional Windows IIS website. There's a little plug. Red Hat Ansible, you can read it or not. <laughs> um, but let's get into how I build this, which is more important. So I'm going to switch to VS Code for a moment and show you this could be a script. This is the playbook to create that website. 
So yeah, we, we do a lot of our development uh, playbooks inside VS Code. There's a plugin, which is pretty neat. Gives you a few extra capabilities. If you've ever done a playbook or written a YAML file, you know, just dealing with spaces can be a real pain. Um, so the VS Code makes that simple, let you know if you've screwed up your spaces. And the other key thing is it has some, some each additional capabilities, such as hovering over what we call a module and going in the module index to read about it. So this playbook does three steps. So it's a simple application, but remember, even the most complex applications are a sequence of simple steps. It does three steps. It goes in here and uses the Wind feature module, uh, which is you know Microsoft module, to install IAS server. It's a Windows role and just basically says install IIS if it's not there, right? If I ran that over and over again, if, if it's already installed, it just says, Jim, it's already where it needs to be, just reports back, okay. Uh, the second step is another simple Windows feature, which is a Win service, just ensure that the W3 SVC service is started, nothing exciting there. And the third step is uses a very complicated module, it's called Win Copy, just copies files, to copy the contents of that II server. So every time I make a change to the contents, it will get pushed out like this. So a sequence of three steps, which I can run, uh, that will essentially uh, create that, web, uh, that website. Uh, I'm going to make a change to this. But before I do that, let me go run it and see and sh quickly show you what it looks like. So I can confidently run that playbook uh, through my automation platform here. I'm using Tower. Um, and it just it's going to play back those three commands. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. And the last step being just debug something to the screen. So it goes in here. It grabs the source from my master branch and source control. And it will go in here and run those three steps. And because I just ran it a while ago, it will give me some deprecation warnings and just behind a little bit. Uh, it will go in here, attempt to install IIS. Nope, didn't have to do, it was already there. Start the service, the service has already started. Hey, the, in, the content is where it needs to be. It did nothing but report back. So, you know, item potency is a good thing. Desired state using playbooks and modules can help you get there. So now that I know that my, and my website, hopefully, didn't change at all. So I can just refresh that and still run. But now I'm going to go and make a change. Um, so let's 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 have a look at what that looks like. Um, so here's my uh, my website, my instructions. I've got some configuration in here as well. And I'm going to go in here and say uh, this is my very simple traditional Windows and say hello. I'm going to change something. And say hello all and make that change, right? So I'm going to save that, okay, in here, and obviously VS Code, if you've used it, you know, it's open source, produced by Microsoft, uh, supports many different languages. Um, I'm going to make that change and uh, save this away. Oops. Let me just, okay, uh, click on here. Yep, so it just tells me I've made a change. Uh, I'm on my demo gym, that's my feature branch. And I'm just going to say, because I'm working in a traditional environment, I've got a, a, a CR, a change request. I'm going to uh, push that, uh, make that, commit that change and push it up. So going back to my picture, just to set the scene, is what I'm doing here is as a, as a peer, uh, I, I needed to make a change to my website. I've gone and changed some configuration in this particular scenario and I've checked it in. So what it should do now is kick off my pipeline and I'll take it, walk you through what that looks like. So let me go into GitLab. I'm using GitLab Runner here because it's uh, easy to use and easy to set up, but it could be any pipeline. I'm going to go into my pipelines and here we go, just started, all right? So as I said, shown in the picture, the first step is run a pre-check. The second step is to destroy any environment before. Just in case, the third step is a lint. I purposely, I sometimes break it, but considering time, I didn't want to break it today. Give you a linting error, then I go back and fix it, but I won't do that today. And then um, it's going to go and create my little test environment, uh, which basically talks to AWS and tells it to provision a little VM. And then once that gets done, that takes a little bit of time. 
it goes and does those testing. Uh, it checks to make sure I haven't broken item potency in my, in my particular playbook, but also does some smoke tests to ensure that the outcome is still achieved after my change, maybe website up or some other tests and balances that checks and balances that you want to do. And, and we'll go through the process of doing that. Okay. So you can click on here and you can dig a bit deeper. It's using molecule converge here. And you can see that it's doing a molecule converge scenario AWS. You can have different scenarios. So you can test the same code, say on VMware, if it's on premise or a different cloud, if you run the application in different clouds. So it allows you to test against different scenarios. So that's off it's going. If I go back to up in, into my AWS, maybe hit a refresh. If I'm lucky, there it is. That little uh, VM has sprung up. It's just initializing. So I'll just assume that works, right? Because I haven't really done anything major. It shouldn't break. So going back to my pipeline, just go back. And I can refresh here. It should just uh, be kickstarting and off it goes. So it's running. It's just taking a bit of time to spin up. So let me uh, assume success. We'll go through the process, run my test. Let's assume success and uh, assume I am now here at everything is green. Uh, I've, I've done some unit testing, and now I want to get into this sort of uh, scenario where I'm going to peer review. I'm going to put my a new hat on. You shouldn't be peer reviewing your own code. Maybe the merge function is separate from the developer, or you know, you switch roles within your organization. However, you want to do that. But the reality here, I want to just double check, triple check everything because I'm going to go straight to production, straight to master uh, from, 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 from dev, uh, which is not really the right way to do it. You go through stages. But nonetheless, today I'm just going to merge it back into here. So I'll go back into VS Code. Um, I'm going to do it from the command line because I like the command line. Um, I've, I'm in my environment. I just want to check some things. I'm going to do a git uh, branch. I want to be on the demo branch. Uh, I'm on the master branch. So, yep. Uh, let me just change that up. Check out. Uh, oops. Do a tab. Yes. Demo gem. Okay. Um, I typically want to do a cat on the file to make sure that uh, I'm working on the right. File, yep, that's the file. That is my older version. I haven't done my pull yet, so before you're going to do merge, you want to get pull from from the demo branch, get the latest. Okay, I'm going to do my little cat now. Yes, I've got the hello all, so that's the, that's the change that I made. I peer review it. Yep, pretty it's pretty pretty simple change. I trust uh, Jim. He's a good guy. He doesn't stuff up too often. But you want to do, you know, some extra testing here, and maybe some, maybe call someone. Why did you do it? All that kind of stuff. Maybe do a, you know, peer review over over the web. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So I want to go in there now, promote that to master. So let me go and go to and do my merge. So let me go get check out back to master. All right. Uh, I'll check that version that's there. Yeah, it's the older version saying simple, powerful, and ageless. Okay, I'm going to just show you a couple of steps because I can't type. I'm just going to run some, some a little script that does the merge, just typical merge, and um, promote, which basically does the merge. So now I'm on the master branch. Uh, I'll just do a last little check on, and check that file. And I can see here I've got my hello all in there, all right? So going back to my picture to set the scene, really all I've done here is merge that particular feature tip after a, a bit of code reviewing, maybe talking to some people, and merge that back up into the master branch. So now I need to release it. As I said, I'm going to use uh, Ansible Tower today to push the change out. It links up and grabs the latest from uh, my source control because that's how I've set it up here. So Tower connects into my GitLab and grabs the latest. Every time I click this little launch button, this little rocket button, and I can watch it and go. So now I'm pretty confident. I'm releasing change into production. Uh, I've gone through my pipelines. I've uh, pre-reviewed the code. 
I know what I'm going to release, or I've got my, my, my standard change process going. Don't have to do a, a big change control board type thing. And I can sit here and watch it carefully because now I'm going through production. So it's going to be similar to before, right? But I should see a change. Yes. So that content was changed. It says it here, right? So all it's done here is, yep, uh, WS is already installed. The service is there. All I've got to do is change this one thing. So it's that if in state, don't do anything. If not in state or else, change. So it's gone and made the change. So I can quickly go here, hit the refresh button, and now I've got my hello all. Pretty boring, right? But think about all the things that I've adopted here to achieve that change and how it can change the game in terms of how you introduce change into the environment via automation and developer type principles rather than traditional manual ways or script ways directly into the environment. So let me recap and uh, talk a little bit about how you get there. So yeah, so what I've really done there is, you know, going back to my picture here, I hope you can all see it, is really start to think about taking these things that are out there. You might have 50 different IIIS servers that you have to support within a large enterprise environment, maybe more, 100, you know, some organizations have a lot of it. Creating a, a set of uh, codifying it to the point where you can have a reproducible set of automations that you can build upon. Uh, you know, 50% of it might be the same for the whole environment, and then you might have some others, but you're building it all in automation, in script and data and configuration, checking that into source control, leveraging the capabilities of source control, but then leveraging some developer principles like unit testing, pipelines, peer review coding, etc., before you release through automation and release that into the and, and strive for that, you know, better than 10% right now to something like 20 and 30 percent. Okay, that's my demo. It worked. Thank you, Andrew. You're a champion. You build great environments. And we all we all deploy these environments through code as well. So let me go back in and sort of start to wrap it up um, and uh, tell you a little bit um, how you make this real. So where to start is generally where I get asked. I mean, it's a lot to do um, and you're not going to get there overnight. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of use cases where you can start bite size, you know, tackle a challenge at a time. And see, here are some of the, the common ones that I want to share. Hopefully, you know, that, that there might be something that you can do in your environment or start to think about doing in your environment. And um, networks, believe it or not, networks are a wonderful use case for being able to um, start to treat um, that infrastructure and work with SRE type principles. I work with organizations who are calling themselves network reliability engineering teams, borrowing from site reliability engineering teams in very traditional environments. And the reason why I say it's a pretty nice place to begin is that there's a lot of devices and there's a lot of similar devices, but there's enough variety out there to, to start to think about maybe um, automating and borrowing from SRE type practices. Um, so yeah, uh, current state, uh, tell me if this sounds familiar, semi-manual or outsourced managed network operations in large environments, thousands of devices, uh, tens of thousands of devices, sometimes in the large institutions. And what you need to do here potentially or approach, uh, which we reckon uh, uh, might help you, is the first step is taking all these different devices you may have and the hundreds and thousands of things potentially and being able to collect information from them and store them in source control, right? Baseline that environment. Just know what's out there. You know, use your CMDBs. Hopefully they're up to date. Get them up to date if you can. Pull from that CMDB and say, give me the current status of my environment, which is really easy to do, right? Because you, got, you, you might have like these modules that are out there for Ansible modules that can talk to everything in a common way. Then you take that and you store that in, in source control. Okay, and we call that baseline. The next simple step to do, because you've got these um, these scripts or playbooks that are IDA potent, um, guess what? You can run the same scripts that you use to provision these environments based on the data that's there and, quick and easily scan to see if drift has occurred. Has change happened out of change control? Because you still need change control 
but you need to, uh, so once you've got it in source control you can just quickly check every every so often to see if you've drifted from desired state a really simple thing to do uh, stage one and stage two you can get there pretty quick but then you can start to get a little fancier um, and again just like the, the the sre team the red hat sre team they didn't start from day one automating everything they chose uh, common patterns right and uh, I don't know, there's probably not a lot of net network people on the, in the audience, but you're probably familiar. There's a whole suite of activities that network teams have to do at speed and scale in large, diverse environments, like just gather the facts, install the config, scan, remediate, uh, update uh, SNMPs, um, change NTP, sync up the times, uh, adjust local passwords. So it's really taking on one use case at a time starting with things that are lower effort, effort to implement, high impact in terms of time and effort that's taken out there. So building up that catalog. And then finally, really, now that you've got things in source control, make changes in source control to the, through source control to the environment, through pipelines, through testing, through unit testing, just like I showed you. That's an example of networks. And I'll give you one more. Um, security is a really great example as well. Um, this is common. Um, security, security policy that for uh, a Windows server, a Linux server, a network device is often, you know, a, you know, borrow a standard, maybe it's SIS or some other one, and the security or cybersecurity team says, "Here's your policy document. Um, uh, Windows team, go and do it. Linux team, go and do it. Here's the policy. Make it so across, you know, or your complex, diverse environment." And often it's like, here it is, here's a document. But what we're, so, what we're doing is taking that security policy, which is in a static PDF, handballed, maybe, it's probably a bad word, but given to an operations team and make it so, converting that document into a script, configuration, instructions, right? That's all policy, security policy is in the end. It's a set of steps and, and, and configurations that need to be done to Windows OSs, Linux OSs, networks. Being able to take that static document and make it a living manifestation of that and checking it into source control, right? So similar to the network sort of scenario, converting documents into uh, codify them in living documents. And then once you've done that, things start to really roll. So there's a bit of effort to do that, no doubt. You can borrow from others that have done it, um, but implement your version of it. And no wonder, uh, no, most likely your enterprise will have a slightly deviated version from the standard. But nonetheless, take it, codify it, put it in source control, have different versions for slightly different environments, building upon a base and you know, reusability and all that kind of jazz. Then anytime you provision a new environment, at that time of provisioning, you grab the latest and greatest of the master branch or a particular branch that you want to use for this scenario and grab it from there and apply it, okay? So provisioning the latest and greatest security standard for a particular type of device, Windows, network, Linux, whatever it may be, pulling that from code at that time of provisioning and getting that to the right standard. And then guess what? Drift becomes easier to manage. These Scripts or playbooks, if they're written in that um, that word, item potency or desired state sort of methodology, uh, you use exactly the same playbooks used to provision. Uh, you use that to check, has it drifted? Run it every six hours. If it drifts, report. Or if you're confident, push back because it came out of change. And when you need to introduce change, change is done here in a central place. A new branch is created. Uh, demo bra uh, features branches created, testings occurred, move it to master. The next one that's provisioned is the latest and greatest. And the next scan tells you it's out and pushes it back, right? So there's two common use cases that we can apply some of the principles I've talked to about today, um, start to break that sort of uh, balance from maybe 20%, maybe I was being too tough, 20% automated, 80% manual, picking that use case at a time, and, uh, you know, maybe improving the speed at which you can uh, achieve things within these brownfields environments. More importantly, buying back time to do more innovative work like, you know, some of the, the maybe the cloud projects or 
the containerization of monolith microservices, all that more interesting type of work for your organizations. So with that, I think I've used up most of my time, I think 40 minutes I was told, so 40 minutes I took. Um, really opening up to questions, I have a provisioning example. I'll share this deck out for you with all the details today. So thank you. Uh, that was the session. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope that you got something out of it. Happy to open up questions. That was great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jim. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come through, and, and I know that I've got a few questions myself. One that Andrew's touched uh, or, or met, I'll tried to or pass over to you is, is what level of um, ML and AI are you incorporating into the practice to predict issues earlier? Now, this one came through a little bit earlier in the presentation. Yes. Uh, in the approaches that I've talked about, not much, um, <laughs> to be honest, uh, because we haven't got that far. Um, but, I, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was probably really more of an SRE question at the time, Jim, because you're talking about the Red Hat SRE team. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if they do anything yet or not. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah. But I can we find might, out. Yeah. We might find out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I, absolutely, you know, the uh, you know, bringing in machine learning, intelligence, looking for patterns, taking the you know course of action. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the other questions has come through, and um, given you work for Red Hat, I'm sure you're going to say no. But um, Maya's mentioned she, has, she hasn't had the pleasure of working on uh, of using Ansible on Windows yet. Have you had any issues that, thus far? So again, I didn't quite get the question. Was it? That's okay. I was just uh, the question was um, Maya said she hasn't had the pleasure of, of using Ansible on Wind Windows yet. Have, have any oh, of you any issues? Yeah. yeah, we lots of customers use it in the wild, large institutions. So there's a lot. There's a large array of Windows modules, as we like to call them. Um, give it a crack. Have a play. We also run hands-on workshops, public free ones, uh, which you can attend. And there's Windows flavored ones. Andrew, you run those, right? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're doing them quite a lot in isolation these days, which is keeping me on my toes. Uh, but yeah, we have um, Windows One, RHEL, automation, security, and um, network as well. Yeah. So they're four hour hands on workshops. So a great way to have a play and, and, and learn. And then you can take it out and try it. Um, another question that's come through from, from May and a, a really good question, um, given what you kind of mentioned, just to finish off there, do, do you think that you'll potentially see a, a merge of F, F, SRE and um, network reliability engineering roles in the future? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've, I first heard that term coined about a year ago. It was for a bank, believe it or not. Um, and uh, that, person that took over that team came from a cloud vendor, right? Um, but I think it's such a, a natural, as I was saying, it fits the pattern of having lots of common things. Uh, you might have variety for sure, but if you've got lots of common things, SRE practices really adopt themselves well, well to that. So yeah, I, I do see it taken on for sure. Yeah, great. And I, I, th I think I've seen it a li little bit too with the, the data, data as well. So, um, okay, cool. Um, David is asked, referring to the two-stage uh, approach side on, on network and security, what specific uh, steps in the approach do you find the most challenging to keep the momentum? All right, so two different challenges depending on the use case. Um, so is that, I guess was, I'll, I'll take this one and the security one separately. So here's the, the, the network one. The real challenge here is um, this one's a bit easier because we have now the ability to talk to lots of different vendors, right? Um, so the challenge becomes if you don't have a, a module and you might have a, a fairly old bespoke version that's not supported. But if you do have um, these things called Ansible modules for all the devices in your environment, gathering the information and storing it, in config, uh, sorry, as code and, and storing it in source control, really easy. Uh, the then the checking is, is fairly easy. These two stages are fairly easy if there's module support. And then really uh, the hard stuff is then starting to look at where do I begin? Uh, and I say always the low effort, high impact. 
and as you get more advanced, uh, you learn and you get faster. Uh, and then getting to this last point, you know, it's generally a journey, right? So I think um, with that, the first stages are easy. With security, the hardest stage is creating the uh, converting uh, documents. Uh, if you've ever read a CIS uh, level one <laughs> document, it's uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of steps. Uh, and that, that effort of conversion of those policies as document into living manifestations of code or playbook can be a major leap. Um, and a lot of time is put in, an effort into it. So that's where the, the effort is. You can borrow from uh, like, there's lots of like in Galaxy, Ansible Galaxy, that's like a place where people share. Uh, we can't do Sys as Red Hat because it's a proprietary thing. Um, so, so others have contributed uh, automation playbooks, but we can't certify them is my point. Um, so you can borrow from them, uh, but that's the effort up here, creating that, that first step. Once you have it, then, you know, these things change fairly frequently, but you're making small changes over time, all right? And then you can do your provisioning and, and, and desired state management fairly simply. That's a, that's a big leap for some organizations, okay? Yeah. Um, I, I had a question myself. Um, uh, given the, the kind of typical devs, more kind of introverted personality, um, do you think that that makes adopting SRE uh, more challenging? Oh, I think it's uh, it's more challenging. I think in terms of brownfields, what I see is um, like people are wedded to a lot of uh, traditional ways of working. Uh, the developers have kind of, I wouldn't call them introverts. I think they've, uh, they've made a name for themselves over the last three or four years. Develop, a lot of enterprises are developer first organizations as opposed to years ago when they were saying, we don't develop, we buy off the, off the shelf cots our business is banking or government, you know. So I think developers have got a greater voice. But in, but when it comes to operations, I think because um, of the sort of, I see a lot of like friction between operations and developers, developers using all these cool technologies, moving a little bit quicker, having early success, but maybe burdened by day two. Um, I find that operations, people say, oh, we don't want to do what they're doing and, you know, then it doesn't really apply to our stuff. So rather, I don't think it's uh, developers uh, in the corner anymore. They're, they're out there in front leading a lot of this. And I find that operations teams uh, have been slow to adopt because there hasn't been a nice way of doing it. And again, going back to those challenges. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Um, th there's been another question that's come through. Um, how do you uh, incorporate regular patching into your approach? Yeah, I was going to cover that uh, third use case. Um, uh, so this is provisioning. So I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, but yeah, so monthly patching is a thing. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, over the last year or so, I just hear it. We need to punch, uh, punch, patch monthly. Uh, and a lot of organizations can't even, can't even get to patching once a, or half a year, once every six months. So what we do there is take a very similar approach, um, but it's a little bit more different. Uh, and it applies to Windows and Linux. And what we do to help organizations achieve um, monthly patching is kind of change the game a bit. So being able to patch at speed, if you've got like, I don't know, satellite for Linux or SCCM for Windows, that patching function is you can push it and say, patch all my servers. The problem is you can't push that button because it breaks things, right? So the approach we take is to incorporate um, the stuff before that patching function. You know, am I ready? Um, are my applications ready? Uh, do the patch, then the stuff after the patch, which is are my applications back up, do my testing. That's an automation workflow. And then allowing teams to patch applications. So self-servicing that function to the application teams who have these maybe uh, pet type applications that need a lot of love and allowing them to self-service the patching service when they're ready, incorporating pre-tests, unit tests, patch, post-tests in, in, in sort of an automation workflow. And that's how we're helping customers achieve 
a, a higher sort of cadence of patching without breaking things. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one question that we asked Michael last week is, is in regards to, because um, we, we had people at, uh, at various levels on the call, is, is, is kind of what reading material um, would you suggest if, if people are, are keen to learn more in regards to your uh, SRE? I mean, the one that Narayan sort of uh, recommended for me when he when I when I met him about a year and a half ago and he presented this to me was that the Google SRE book, the handbook. It's kind yeah. of like the Bible almost, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. And again, it's about you know, unless you're a hyperscaler or you've got a large environment where that is homogenous. That's what he says too. Um, you got to borrow those, those principles and start to adopt them into the way you do brownfields, yeah? So it's not everything, it's some things. And there's some really good ideas in there that you can adopt straight off the bat. People and process things, not just technology. Yeah, great. Um, I think that was all the questions that have come through and um, all the questions that, that I had. Um, I don't know if any of the other co-organisers had anything that they wanted to, to ask. Yeah, I've, um, it's, it's Stephen here, Jim. Thank, thank you very much for your time tonight. And that, that was a really interesting talk. Um, my questions around observability. Just you know, you've you uh, you guys get to see an awful lot of clients and help an awful an awful lot of your customers. So when it comes to observability, when people are talking about SRE, do you get the feeling that they're still talking about um, ca capturing metrics? You know, HTTP response times. Java metrics or are they changing a perspective more in line with the customer and actually monitoring user workflows as well? Yeah, I mean, look, that's a great question. Um, going back to back here where we start to bring in monitoring and alerting, which is everything within SRE, and then having the ability to, you know, self-heal a lot of the common challenges to restore a service without a human. Um, but yeah, being able to understand what's happening in the environment. So what, what, he, what he says here is obviously there's the platform component, which you'll be able to monitor and manage and observe and respond to. But then when you add these applications on top of it that start to change behavior of things and, you know, and do their own crazy little things, he says that um, really important to combine um, from observability, the performance of the underlying platform with, with metrics that represent the application. So allowing developers to add um, their monitoring easily, incorporating the underlying infrastructure and, and be able to view it together, right, and then take necessary action. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you know, the concept is, obviously observing the platform but observing the platform in context to application metrics and, and embedding monitoring into your applications as you build them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the, the traditional sort of DevOps approach uh, has, in, in my, my humble opinion, I've come from an operations background and not, not a dev background. Yeah. Um, so my, my observation of devs is that it seems to be more, more interested in capturing uh, the sort of metrics that, that I described before are not necessarily those that the people in operations would be you know would be considering and wanting to capture user workflows, for instance, like using tools like Selenium. And yeah. Maybe it's still too hard. Maybe the maybe well, people in the car think that way more. Or and then you've got your sort of the application performance monitoring sides of the of, of the game, which is less operational, application focused, where you're essentially doing what you said, you know, customer clicks a particular part of your application. It can trace the, the transaction into the application code and then correlating both operational sort of perspective as well as uh, application monitoring, correlating those two and helping you troubleshoot problems super fast. So, you know, it's also the, the, the whole app, APM, the application performance monitoring, you know, thing has grown tremendously over the last five, six, seven, eight years, right? And you've got so many players in the market right now. Sure. I'd be curious, just to, if anybody out in chat land there, uh, if you've noticed 
a paradigm shift to get closer to your customer that your monitoring has had to be updated. Uh, I'd be interested to hear to hear your comments. I think someone made a good chat, Stephen, in the chat earlier, and they said, "Give the devs a pager." And then obviously things are going to get fixed a lot quicker. <laughs> um, culture, I, culture, culture. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's it's great to hear. You know that people are fi finally thinking about getting closer to getting closer to the customer, narrowing the gap between the code and the customer, which is just awesome to see. And that's the way it should be. <laughs> anyway, I shall get off my um, my soapbox and, pa and pass back to you, Tom. I think there was just one more. Um, so there's one more question uh, in the chat. Um, Navdi just mentioned what ideas can you suggest to put in place to deal with an outage to get the root cause immediately? I don't know if that's been covered off yet. I thought we sort of covered it, but yeah, I mean, the root cause, right? Um, so I guess it's more of a monitoring uh, discussion, but observability is part of it. But um, yeah, you've got an. Well, I think an outage is easier because you probably have to restore the service. Maybe something's broken completely. But the harder one is a, a performance degradation, being able to troubleshoot that quickly. And that's when going back to observability, being able to transaction trace from the click on a particular application or the API call into a particular middleware or so middle tier type server, being able to trace that, okay, um, and then correlate the code, because you can actually trace the code, this called that, that called that, and isolate where in the code the problem is, but most importantly is also correlating it, is it slow today because I've got an operational bottleneck? So that's, that's a way of troubleshooting very, very quickly, but you've got to combine application monitoring with the underlying operational monitoring and uh, provide that context together, and that's how you can actually troubleshoot performance degradation. I think an outage, uh, albeit bad, is often your restore service. You might and want I think to, yeah. the great thing there is, Jim, that APM has certainly come a long way these days. Uh, but once that, maybe you've got to a resolution and maybe things can happen automatically in the background. Mm -hmm. But once that is identified, then you can self-heal, right? So that's that whole automation thing that Jim spoke about where you don't have to wake the individuals up at, at 3 a.m. And then once it is, is in a state where it's restored, that's terrific. If it's not restored, you can automatically raise it into service now as an example, and then wake those people up. Um, but but certainly lots of options. Yeah, great. Um, I think that was all on the question front.